and welcome to Mindset, an HCD vidcast, where we dive into the world of applied consumer neuroscience and market research with leading experts in the field. My name is Michelle Nigella, PhD in behavioral neuroscience and director of research and innovation at HCD. And I'm Catherine Ambrose, the manager of behavioral and marketing sciences with HCD. As your hosts, we are going to act as the buzzkills for the buzzwords, taking time to critically think about the limitations and pitfalls of emerging trends and topics within the field to help you identify what innovation has a lot of untapped potential or is too good to be true. Now, HCD is a full service research house which provides research capabilities on consumers by looking at how they perceive, evaluate, and respond to different types of stimuli, such as looking at product experiences, communications, or just general consumer and shopper experiences. We use a combination of tools that come from psychology, physiology, neuroscience, as well as the traditional methods that people typically use to see how they experience different stimuli. That stimuli can range from the early stages of exploration all the way through the final product validation tests. This is what we refer to as applied consumer neuroscience. So stick around for more curious conversations as we chat our way through the ever evolving space of consumer science. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Mindset. We are so excited to have you here. We are your hosts, Catherine Ambrose and Michelle Nigella. And we're really, really excited to be talking to you today. It's just going to be the two of us because this recent article came out that we thought was really important for us to discuss. And we have we, thoughts. Yeah, we have our thoughts. So why not share <laughs> them if people will listen? <laughs> So this is going to be a little bit of a, you know, semi-intense journal club, right? So in the spirit of journal club, we're going to talk about a recent publication that is relevant to the field, um, super relevant for Catherine. And we decided to talk about this one because it was so relevant for her that she was in some online discussions with her classmates. Um, You know, she probably, when you guys are listening to this, she will no longer be a student. Um, or maybe she still will be, but at some point in the future, she will no longer be a student. But right now she is a student at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit, Catherine? Tell us what sure. you're doing. Yeah, sure. So I am finishing up my master's right now in behavioral and decision sciences. And so people always ask what that actually means. And it is a very interdisciplinary program. They, they have people come from the world of economics, the world I'm from, you know, a bit more of a research background. My background's in neuroscience and psychology. They have people come in that are interested in um, policy and policy making. And so there's really this big combination of things that are shared and and thrown together because the world of humans is complex and complicated, but the whole point of the program is really to think critically about research and be able to do behavioral science, which is generally about, um, about humans. There's really not too much, there's not too much research about animals. But it's kind of specifically in decision sciences, right? So it's even like the name of the program is decision sciences. And I think a lot of that has like to give some historical perspective that we've talked a little bit about is, you know, the the Church of Kahneman, as I often call it. Um, He isn't all of behavioral economics, however. Right. So Daniel Kahneman with his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, all of that became really super popular for a bit, maybe like. Um, I don't know, eight, five years ago, um, where every meeting you went into with a client, they were like, what about system one? How are you measuring system one? And interestingly, that's all kind of fallen out of favor. I do feel like, you know, there are these cycles that everybody goes through of popularity where, you know, 15 years ago is neuromarketing, neuromarketing, neuromarketing. And then the language changed a little bit because there was some bad juju going on with um, neuromarketing as a term. And they started using a lot of like non-conscious discussion and saying implicit versus explicit, which led us more into the Kahneman space of people talking about system one versus system two. And that that's kind of fallen out of style too. Um, unfortunately for some companies that actually changed their name uh, to reflect that fad, but the I don't want to say it's a fad, but the terminology has changed to be behavioral sciences, which is 
a little bit more all encompassing, but when it comes from the academic side, I think it has been focusing more on decision making and influencing decision making. Exactly. Which still is in the wheelhouse of behavioral economics, which, you know, again, if you think of Thayer or if you think of Kahneman, really is about what is driving your decision making. How are people making decisions? Um, and brings us to the world of nudges. So Catherine, what is a nudge? Good question. So the idea of nudge theory is that um, you can change certain things through indirect suggestions that will then influence behavior and influence decision making. So if you nudge someone in a specific way, it's usually in a desired direction. So when people set up an intervention with nudges, they are intentionally trying to encourage a certain choice. So they're playing a bit with the choice architecture to try and and influence how you are going to make that decision to almost suggest that there is a, a quote unquote correct path or a path mm-hmm. that is more desired. And there are very various different types of nudges. So one that's very common is a default, which is used very frequently. And a default, one really great example is there was research done with organ donors where you just simply have, um, there was two options and it was the default was I will be an organ donor on the form and or I will not be an organ donor. And by simply switching it to I will be an organ donor increased uh, um, significantly that people would be willing to become organ donors. So that suggests that it wasn't necessarily about the topic of organ donations, but it was just the default that had influenced that yeah. decision. And um, it, you know, it makes sense to a lot of people. And I think that's what all these different, like, I don't, again, I don't want to minimize them by saying fads, but these sort of cycles that people go through in theoretical frameworks, you know, whether it's neuromarketing or behavioral science and nudges, um, it all makes sense. And so it seems intuitive, right? So neuromarketing seemed intuitive to people where it wasn't really just about measuring surveys that, oh, if we can measure the brain, um, that's going to give us a lot more information and maybe we can read people's minds, right? And then when it comes to systematic thinking, really looking at how much emotion influences our behaviors. And, And that makes sense to people. So, you know, even when it comes to questions, if you were to ask people, um, about increasing voting, right. Voter, um, registration, that if it just went along with your driver's license, would that increase the likelihood of people participating in voting or at least being registered to vote? And obviously being in that default space, Um, where everybody's registered that has a driver's license, um, it it would increase those numbers, right? It makes sense to people. If you make it easier to recycle recyclables, people are going to be more likely to recycle. It makes sense. Right. And there are certain places, I know you touched on neuromarketing, where it wasn't really that difficult to change the the choice architecture in some place like a store, where if you want to increase people to try and eat healthy foods, make that food more visible, make the options a bit more visible. But then also you can see the traditional way of a layout when you are trying to do some impulse buying at the very end at checkout, They don't really use, they don't typically put out fruits and veggies when you're checking out, it's gum. Something that's going to appeal to, again, that system one thinking, which is immediate reward, right? right? So it all makes sense, like why you end up impulse buying the, these things that aren't on your list. Because if you were truly just a cognitive person and you thought about all your decisions, um, you would not make that impulse buy for that stick of gum or that candy bar. Um, you know, maybe you would, maybe it's on your list and that's totally okay. We're not, you know, judging your your choices. Um, but all the, the point is that all of these trends, that's maybe a better word than fads, all these trends in, in research and in industry research, um, are intuitive and, and have a reason that they become popular. And then there's also a reason they fall out of popularity. And sometimes it's because, you know, research comes out that disproves what people were saying, you know, like with neuromarketing, there are all these research studies coming out that said, you know, for example, that fMRI is, can be very biased when people do the analytics. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be that people were overstating their claims, right? So saying that you could read someone's mind with a $100 EEG headset. Um, 
you know, maybe it is, you know, this sort of day of reckoning that came with people focusing only on system one, understanding, no, we're not entirely emotional creatures. We have cognitive things that go on that influence our decision-making as well. We're not all id, we are also ego and super ego, right? Like we're, there's a lot going on with us. Um, we're complicated creatures, as Catherine was saying earlier. So then here we are with this super popularity of behavioral science and nudges. You have um, academic institutions all over the world that have all of these programs going right now where people can go and get masters like Catherine's doing. They can learn really strong analytical skills and learn about theories of human behavior, which are so important in industry. And now you're also seeing um, a lot of jobs being advertised and the whole entire departments being organized around choice architecture and nudging and behavioral sciences and behavioral architects. And so taking that into account, the, the popularity of this particular trend, again, it's intuitive. It all makes sense that if we're looking at consumers, we ultimately are looking at their behaviors, which are their decision-making. Are they gonna purchase this product? Are they gonna reuse this product? Are they using the product correctly? All these sort of questions come down to behavioral sciences approaches, which include economics and includes psychology and neuroscience and statistics and all these things that work together to help us predict ultimately and, and as well as shape yeah. what consumers are going to do. And I think that's a great point that you touched on that there are all these departments and things that are being funded and being used, but the truth is nudging is not all of behavioral science. They're not synonymous yeah. with them on each other. It's just one facet of it. And there are so many other things that are important, which is, it seems very obvious, but when the, um, when companies and when schools or whoever it is, is marketing behavioral science, they often just rely on people knowing about nudging and knowing about what is popular in the news and what is popular in pop yeah. culture to like entice people. And so I think it is important to one, recognize that nudging isn't all of behavioral science. We're much more complex than just the, you know, the way that we have a store layout. There's yeah. much more to it than that. And we really behavioral science as a whole concept is not new either. It just has a new name. Exactly. This research and this approach has been used for hundreds of years. I mean, marketing, you know, to help people make decisions to influence people's behaviors has been done since day one, right? right? That's what That's marketing is really all about. That's the point, getting people to recognize your brand and to buy your product. Um, so none of it's actually new, but the name itself is new. And, you know, yes, some of the techniques are new as well, uh, but there's a lot of excited people out there, which is great, right? Um, but there's, you know, I'm a skeptic, I'm a pessimist. And so the way I always like to approach all these things, because I've seen a lot of these fads come and go, yeah. um, is that you have to be aware that you have to change with the science, right? Yeah. So you have to be aware that science isn't perfect. It's always self-correcting. Um, you have to be aware that you should never put all of your eggs into one basket because it's not all going to be EEG and it's not all going to be facial coding. It's not all going to be nudges, right? Um, there are so many other factors co to consider. We're not just non-conscious, unconscious beings. We are not just emotional beings. We have all sorts of things going on with us, a whole, you know, rainbow of inputs and context going on that, that form our behaviors. So when we see an article come out, uh, my immediate reaction is like, all right, get out the popcorn because this is going to be a really entertaining ride. And yesterday, Catherine texted me and, you know, she, I, I almost feel like I should pull up the text, but you know, she was saying, oh my goodness, like, you know, the bleep has hit the fan because um, in, in these chat groups for the students um, that are in this space, uh, because this new article has come out. Um, and so I'm gonna share my screen, but for, um, but for those of you that are just listening, we will um, you know, just link to these. Uh, there will be three articles we're going to discuss. The first one, I thought it would be good, even though the all the um, excitement was over the second article that we're going to show. I, I think it's important to look at the first article because this, the article that caused all the ruckus was a reply, a comment on the original article. So the original article was 
titled The Effectiveness of Nudging, where um, these uh, this group of researchers at Princeton University um, did a meta-analysis looking at studies that had done uh, choice architecture interventions in different types of behavioral domains. So what do we mean about that? It, it's like, when we look at behavioral domains such as food choice or other types of decisions that people make, right, Catherine? Yes. So there are there's this variety of domains that they use, it's behavioral domains where the intervention is taking place. So that could include something like the finance domain. That could include something like the food domain. So there's there's various areas that this um, that these. Uh, papers are being studied in. And so they're also taking into account the environment in which it's happening to see if there are any trends that are going on in specific domains that maybe it's nudging is more effective in one area than in another. Because again, this is a very large scale uh, analysis because it is a meta analysis. It's looking at a bunch of different papers and it's trying to decide, is there an effectiveness to nudging? And, and what these um, what these researchers decided to do was they did this meta analysis and they found that there was, they noticed moderate publication bias. And for those who don't know what that means, and I'll just mention that a big part of behavioral science is also studying biases and associations. So that's just one area that is very important. But to what is about. publication bias? And it, I think it's important to not only define it, but really recognize how not new publication bias is. Right. You know, so, so as someone who come, you know, I was in academia for a while and I've published papers both in academia and in while in industry. Um, in academia, there's very much a publisher parish sort of culture, which in order to have keep your job as a research professor, you have to publish. If you wanna get tenure, you have to publish a significant number of papers a year. And this creates a awkward situation where you're almost like trying to, you're being treated like a factory trying to turn out these papers. So you're doing all of this research try and with the sole goal of getting as many citations as, as possible to increase your index, right? Your impact factor. Um, and it, you can see just in, in this um, graph that is on the screen, if, if you can't see it, it's the first uh, figure in the original article, um, the effectiveness of nudging, where it's just talking about the increase of publications for behavioral sciences and for nudging um, since 2008 to, to 2020. And you can see it just has gone up exponentially. Right. And, and I, mean, I, I would want to cut in here and just say that if we if we're looking at something like this, there's this increase in publications over time with the popularity growing of the idea of behavioral science. But when we think back to what exactly is a public bias, it's really the fact that researchers don't publish their studies because of the direction or the strength of the study. So yeah. if they don't find significant results, they're less likely to be published or to publish. So the wording of that is important though. So it, it is not just that they're not willing to publish, they don't even try because they know they can't. Um, so I have had a negative um, results study published once. And I was not the first author on it. It was uh, during my postdoc. So a much more famous and impactful author was the first author. He was my um, research advisor. And we found no effect um, of a particular treatment. Mm -hmm. And it was in contradiction to a paper we were actually trying to emulate. Now, this is something, this, this is what science is based off, right? The idea that the reason you publish is so that you put what you did how you did it, what results you got so that other scientists can try to replicate it and prove that it's a thing so that then it becomes a theory, right? And because the whole idea of a theory is that it should be tested. The whole idea of science is that we constantly question one another and we correct ourselves. What has happened with this push for publication, publisher parish, and the whole system of, um, you know, this gated community of journals that make money off of the publications, they only want things that are gonna be interesting and impactful. And nobody finds it terribly interesting to see that you replicated someone else's study. It doesn't make you famous to do that, right? Unless you find something really earth shattering, which in science, earth shattering is rare, right? You're usually doing tiny little steps to get towards a larger thing. Um, and so 
when you go to submit your negative results, not only are you going against all of this other research that potentially you're contradicting, um, but it's not very impactful. So it, it's a lot of, you might not even get funding to do that research because people would rather you do something more new. Um, so reviewers are gonna look at it and not only are they gonna question the impactfulness of your study that found nothing, but they're also gonna question your results because you know if you've taken a statistics class, the null hypothesis is something you can never completely validate, right. right? You cannot prove the null hypothesis. You know, I can say that clowns do not pop up in my closet at night, right? Okay. But I can't prove that that will never happen. Exactly. I can say I haven't seen it, <laughs> right? And you can be like, well, you never know. Um, and because that that's the truth of it, we cannot prove the null hypothesis. We can just say what we've observed, we didn't see it. Exactly. And the truth of the matter is, like Michelle mentioned, there is this preference towards positive results because those positive results will get more citations. Mm. And, and it's this almost self-fulfilling like cycle that keeps going on because even if you, you do go and you try to publish a null hypothesis and you, and the person lets you publish it, that publication will not have the same type of impact because people and researchers aren't necessarily going and looking for those null results. Yeah. And so this has been a huge problem in psychological research, right? Where um, there's been a replication crisis yeah. where so much has been focused on publish or perish, publish or perish. People are putting out these positive results and it's expected if you design your study correctly, you should get results, which is very contradictory to the scientific method, which would suggest maybe you get positive results, but it's also very likely that you'll get nothing because maybe your treatment does nothing. That's the point right? of a hypothesis. You're hypothesizing on this notion. Yeah. Based You're on making an educated guess, but you could be wrong, yeah. right? And, and that's, that's okay. science. That should be okay. So, you know, but what's happening now is that research and meta-analyses and, you know, people really thinking harder about it or finding across all psychological research, there is a real problem of studies not being able to be replicated. Exactly. Now, there's a lot of different reasons for this. And Catherine and I have talked extensively about it, but not only are people not replicating studies because they just don't have the funding or interest in doing so mm -hmm. because they won't get published, um, but also psychology and behavioral sciences as a whole is a moving target. Yeah. Um, so if I were to do a self-confidence study on Catherine at this very moment, if I were to test her again later in the day or tomorrow, the results might change um, because she's had other experiences. She's learned things, even in testing memory. I mean, you just, so all these sort of psychological concepts are a bit of a moving target. And so when you think about it on an individual basis, you're going to see a lot of dynamics and, and changes because her psychology and her knowledge and her experience change over time. So we should expect that it's a little mushy. Yeah. And, right? and that goes into discussing, you know, there it's mushy, it's messy. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that you are never the same person that you are twice. So as you yeah. go on, I will be in a different emotional state. My hunger will be different. My, the way that my body functions has altered based on my lived experience. And so that is the nature of human research. And it makes sense that psychology and behavioral science are coming up against similar obstacles. Perhaps the messiest of them all. Right, right. right. Because they both are focusing on, like you said, the messiest of them all, human <laughs> beings. <laughs> I mean, that's why a lot of times, you know, I, I come from animal research, right? So using animal models to look at behavior. And the the thing about it is we we like to use animals because we can control the environment better. We can control their background better. We know who their parents were. We knew what food they ate since they were born. We can look at all of those things, but I have no idea what food Catherine has eaten in her years. Um, I don't know what, you know, entertainment she's been exposed to that are gonna ultimately affect anything that she likes in the future, you know, so it, it's, it's messy to deal with humans. It's clean to deal with animals in a lot of way, because you can control those things. You can't control a human's experience. Exactly. So therein lies all the problems with psychology and behavioral sciences, 
And here's this meta-analysis that is looking at all of these studies to see what they can find in it and what are some similarities, where are things um, perhaps most popularly done, um, do nudges have an effect? And they do mention at one point that there is a publication bias, which again is that people, there, there's an overrepresentation of positive effects, right? That nudges have an effect because nobody wants to publish that nudges don't have an effect or that their study didn't show anything. Um, so this is one of the things they found, but not something they necessarily focused on, correct? Exactly. And the point that they didn't, well, they when they address it, like I mentioned earlier, they viewed it as a moderate publication bias. So they there is this understanding. And then the response to this, which we are about to talk about, is that they this group of researchers disagreed and said, no, it's not moderate, it's severe. That there is when when you account for publication bias, there is really limited evidence that supports the idea that nudging has an effect. And that is a very strong stance to make. Um, yeah. But so here, it just um, for those of you listening, now we are talking about the study that just came out on July 19th this year. The original study came out at the very end, December 30th of last year, 2021. Um, so this study done by Mayer et al. And these, this is a group of researchers. If we look at the author information, um, they come from the UK and Amsterdam. Um, so, you know, you can... Um, take a look at, we'll link them as well, but you can see that they're from University College of London, they're from University of Amsterdam, um, et cetera, in Australia as well, the Deakin University there. And so there's um, a, an interesting group of people that decide to reanalyze the data. And exactly. so their big headline is no, Actually, if we look at this original article, there is no evidence for nudging when you adjust all that data for publication bias, because publication bias has such an impact that they're finding that there's actually no good effect of nudging, that it doesn't have a behavioral consequence when you try to shape someone's behavior. So, of course, for Catherine's cohort of, of you know, and just other classmates, um, they're, you know, finishing up their degrees in behavioral sciences and this based on this whole idea of nudging and they're like oh no right <laughs> you exactly. know like I just spent several years on this you know based off of things that these you know professors have told me is true and here's this study saying nope it's all junk and I what I would say is that more so than hearing that it's true it's it has to become hearing like be a little critical. And that seemed to be the, the notion. And I think that is why there was so much shell shock when this first came out, because it's, it's people wanted to start questioning, well, why is this? How did they get to this place? How can you make a claim like this? Because this is a very strong um, take to make to say that there's no evidence for nudging uh, and when in terms of effects. And the way that this the way that Mayer decide, at all decided to go about this analysis was by using a different, more robust uh, approach. And so what they did is they, it was a robust Bayesian meta-analysis. And by doing that meta-analysis, they were able to show that depending, again, focusing on those domains where they focused on the same domains as the previous article, um, they noticed that there was, like I said, those limited, there's limited evidence towards the idea that there is nudging. However, even in this article, even though it didn't make the title, there are some places where the nudging is still effective. So yeah. this brings us to another point that there is this, again, focus on trying to get a catchy title, trying to get people to be interested in reading the article that people don't really want to look at the fine print. And so yeah. what these people are saying, it's not that all of nudging is terrible and that it doesn't work, but it's just from the analyses that they ran, certain domains have really limited evidence towards it. Whereas other domains such as food and being pro-social was seen indecisive and that uh, when you look at something like finances, finances actually suggest that there still might be 
uh, something effective. There is evidence that's suggesting that nudges are effective. And, and these authors do address that here. Yeah. It's just not necessarily the eye-catching thing that everyone first sees. But it's interesting because if you look at the industry, yes, there's interest in finance so that that might still be really important for them to incorporate into their, you know, UX of people making decisions on their finances, for, just as an example. But maybe for consumer goods companies that are focusing on food, let's not put all our eggs in one basket, right? Mm -hmm. There is a, an effect maybe a little bit, but you also have to continue to do some of the other methodologies and other approaches. Do mm -hmm. not throw them out with the bathwater, right? right. Um, but, you know, again, throw, throwing the baby out with the bathwater sort of concept again, you shouldn't throw nudging out with, with the, the bathwater, right? So there, there is still something there and in incorporating it into your understanding of how consumers are making decisions, how you can communicate to them that your brand or your product is important and meaningful. All those things should still be considered. You don't just throw it out. Um, but it, it was kind of interesting that, um, you know, Catherine's uh, classmates were really having this real reaction uh, because, you know, I guess when I think back on it, I've seen it before. I've seen, you know, the people really turn on neuromarketing. You know, if you look historically, you could see how Coke went um, really against some of the early work they did with EEG and decided, you know what, no EEG for like at least 10 years. Yeah. They wouldn't touch it after having a really bad experience. Um, you know, so like it's just important things like that to recognize that now 10 years later, things have improved. You know, you can go back to using EEG as long as you're using using it in the appropriate way. Um, so it, it, it is an important study. It's important for one, that it's a study about publication bias um, against negative results that actually is publishing negative results. And I think that that is really circular and fun. Um, <laughs> but, you know, also considering the reaction, um, you know, Catherine, of course, always being somewhat of a voice of reason and skepticism it is pointing out kind of the absurdity a little bit of, of reacting too much to, you know, something like this. It doesn't mean that the field is dead. Right. Um, so, you know, there, there's certainly a place for continuing to do behavioral science and not all behavioral sciences is, is nudging. So it's important to keep that in mind as well. And now there can, was a reply. I, I mention as well that you can keep also studying nudging. We shouldn't just, like you said, throw it out because there's suggestions that it's not effective or there's not longitudinal effects in, in any yeah. way. There should be just more consideration when you're doing that type of research. Yeah. If you think about the parameters of your study, think about the confounds of your study and think about what is, is really drawing effects if there are any. Yeah. So if more than anything, I think that this isn't saying, oh, all nudges are lies. No, I think this is saying, let's reflect a little bit and, yeah. and recognize that there are some in inadequacies in the way that we have publications and the way that we approach publishing as a whole. But like mm -hmm. Michelle mentioned, there was even a reply to this now, um, <laughs> which we're going to take a look at, which is great because that means that people are discussing it and, and you know, sharing their input. Yeah. So a lot of times when there is commentary on a paper, um, the editors of the journal will um, approach the original authors and give them an opportunity to answer the criticisms that are placed in, in some sort of commentary. So um, the original authors from uh, the original um, paper were able to respond on the same day that the criticism was put forth. And so they acknowledge um, the, these issues that we're talking about, right, Catherine? Yep, exactly. And, and they, they recognize like even right here on, if you're, if you can't see it right now, there is one part that mentions that they're in uh, that publication bias does exist. They're very much acknowledging that as a really big problem and that it's in favor of reporting on successful implications of choice architecture and in, uh, interventions. And so if that's the case, there has to be Really, I, I think it's important to bring to light through these types of papers that we we have to be publishing more. And if we, we can't publish with the really high impact journals, at least get the papers out, have things be more open source. And, and what's really wonderful is that within these three articles, there was, if you go to look at the PDF of the original article now, they have in big red letters that there's been changes that have been made. Um, I'm not sure if you'll see it on here because it's this isn't the PDF, but 
They try right. to make it noted that this article has been updated. There have been changes made. So that way it's an acknowledgement of this is the scientific this method. This does say the article has been corrected. Exactly. And I think that's wonderful. I think that that's, we need more of this. And, and this is what should be making the impact because this is how science works. It's this mm -hmm. ever evolving, ever changing approach to trying to understand what the heck is going on. <laughs> Yeah, so I think the, the thing here is stay vigilant, stay interested, stay excited. Um, this isn't the end of the world for nudges or behavioral science. Why is it falling? <laughs> this, this is science. This is what happens. And we should be rejoicing because this is exactly how it should go. People should be called out for mistakes they make and they should go back and correct them and credit the people that question them because that is how we should be operating as scientists. It's a you know, the scientific community is about helping each other um, make science better, right? Exactly. And so we should all be open to criticism. We should all be looking at everything with a critical eye and don't just keep it to yourself. If you see something wrong, you should be like, you know, approach that um, that author and, and say, you know what, I, I'm wondering about this, you know, or try to replicate, you know what, try to publish that replication. Because yeah. again, that's the whole point. Exactly. And it's, you know, it's flattering too. don't shy away from reaching out to authors. I can speak to, to Michelle and my experiences that sometimes it feels like you're throwing things into a void. And so when somebody, sometimes writes, you are, <laughs> yeah, and, and if somebody writes back to you, it's really reassuring that people one are thinking about it, but two also want to expand on it. That's a compliment. And that shows that there is scientific integrity that's taking place with all that being said though, Michelle, I do want to try and get to playing our game. All I right. have, I have the 10 words all picked out. So whenever you're ready, I'm, I'm ready. ready all right, here we go. First one, publications. Difficult. Nudging. Challenging. Behavioral science. Open. Replications. Non-existent. <laughs> Null hypotheses. Uh, disprove. Research. Fun. Significance. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> this is like literally what I thought, Sam, as I was writing this. Humans. <laughs> Sorry? Humans. Humans complicated. Evidence. Uh, you know, that makes me think of detectives. <laughs> cool. And the last one I have for you is hypotheses. Um, <laughs> so I guess what pops into my mind is, uh, my six-year-old daughter, uh, trying to say the word hypothesis. Aww, really <laughs> so I can't even replicate oh, okay. like, how she does it, but it, it's very funny. <laughs> Aww, maybe we'll put a clip or something in, if we can get it of her just saying like hypotheses. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you all so much for tuning in and listening to our two cents about these articles. Like Michelle mentioned, we will link them below all three articles, but they, one great thing is that this is open access. So they want people to be reading it. They want people to be responding to it. And so out, go, go out there, be curious, be critical. And until next time, we'll see you. Yeah. Don't give up. All right. Thanks everybody. We will talk to you next time. Bye. HCD Mindset is produced by Helen Ross. For more information or updates, follow HCD Research on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at HCD Research Inc. and at HCD Neuroscience. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to rate, review, and follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you and stay tuned for more curious conversations.